hi, everybody. Thanks for making it out. We are the Colorado Mountain Club, and we'll just give you a little brief introduction about who we are, and then we'll let Tony here go into the uh, bulk of his presentation. So we are a um, nonprofit member organized organization. Uh, we have about 3,000 members all over the state of Colorado, about 700 just here in Colorado Springs. And we pretty much do anything from easy wildflower hikes to ice climbing, rock climbing, skiing, Denali. We have a team at Everest Base Camp and anything in between. So if there's anything outdoors related, we pretty much do it. And the really cool thing about being a member is that one, you get to go on a bunch of trips with other members in the group. So if it's Saturday, I want to go hike something, you just look at our calendar of events and we have maybe 10 or 12 different activities going on. You can just join a trip. And then also we teach classes for all of those outdoor activities that I mentioned. So if you want to learn more about what Tony is talking about today, if you want to take a map and compass, if you want to take a first aid, a snowshoeing class, we offer all of those. We also do conservation work, so trail building and restoration. If you're interested in helping out in trail, like we had a program in the Waldo Burn area. We kind of went up and, you know, rebuilt some of the trails. So if you're interested in giving back to the outdoor community, we offer those as well. And we also have a lot of international travel opportunities. So for instance, this year we sent a team to Aconcagua, to the summit of Denali, to Everest Base Camp, Kilimanjaro. We also sent a team to the Alps and they skied from hut to hut for a week or so. So if you want to get out across the country or overseas for an outdoor trip, we offer that through the club. So now, Tony Exet. Thanks, Kristen. Kristen Buckland is our uh, publicity chairperson for the uh, Pikes Peak Group. Dean Waits is our membership chairman for the Pikes Peak Group. And I am the co-director of our basic mountaineering school. We teach a uh, whole series of classes on uh, outdoor activities. And uh, I participate in, uh, in helping instruct those classes. And so the talk that I've put together today is uh, mostly aimed at safety. We uh, have a very high emphasis on safety in our club. Uh, you know, if we can't do something safe, we'll, we will, we'll figure out some other way to do it. We won't do it if we can't do it safely. And uh, you know, as I'll talk about as we go through the slides here, the mountains are always going to be there. And so if we can't get it done today, uh, you know, we can regroup and come back and do it again another day uh, and enjoy the, uh, the day, even if we have to turn around and not complete what we wanted to. And so uh, kind of the secondary title to my uh, talk here is uh, how to enjoy the mountains and live to post it on Facebook, because uh, we all know that uh, no trip is, is really complete until the pictures have been posted on Facebook. And uh, so hopefully... Uh, some of the things that I'll go through here today will allow you to do that. Mountain safety uh, really comes down to us and the, uh, the people that are going out into the mountains. Uh, those of you that have spent time, particularly on Pikes Peak in the summertime, uh, when the tourists are here, you see all kinds of activities that are done inappropriately. People just flat are not prepared to do the things that they're attempting to do. Uh, you know, even at the bottom of uh, Manitou Springs, you know, it's a relatively high elevation if you're coming from Houston, Texas, you know, or any place at a low elevation. And so, you know, we frequently see uh, people that are not acclimated to the elevation when they come here and improperly prepared with, with gear to do the things they attempt to do. So it's, it's kind of a co combination of uh, developing knowledge, and I'll try to share some knowledge with you here today. Spending time in the mountains and uh, getting experience uh, that you can draw on in the future. And, and then finally, kind of using all of that to build good judgment. Uh, good judgment is just the, the decision-making processes that we make as we're uh, spending time in the mountains. Uh, is that weather rolling in? Should we turn around? Is it look okay? Should we keep going? Those kind of things. And uh, unfortunately, for most of us, uh, good judgment uh, usually flows from some bad judgments that we've made on, on previous uh, trips and experiences. Uh, so uh, those three uh, can really uh, uh, 
get us prepared for spending time in the mountains safely. These are the topics I'm going to try to hit on relatively quickly today. We spend uh, a lot of time in our uh, basic mountaineering school going through uh, all of these topics in depth. But uh, I'll talk a little bit about the 10 essentials, a little bit about first aid, uh, some basic gear that you should have, uh, weather, which is a, is a huge issue here in, in Colorado, uh, hydration, nutrition, a little bit about trip planning, leave no trace so that uh, after we come back out of the mountains, the uh, people that go out there next time can, can fully enjoy uh, the same experience that we had. And then a little bit about uh, animals at the end. These items are the 10 essentials, and every uh, good hiker should take these 10 items with them every time they go in the mountains. We spend a fair amount of time talking about these in our classes, but the uh, first point is navigation. You might have seen an article in the Gazette this morning or on KOAA 5 there last night. Uh, there was uh, three uh, hikers lost on the west side of Pikes Peak yesterday. And uh, this time of the year when the snow covers over the, tra the trails and you can't really see where the trail goes, it's pretty easy to get off the trail and uh, end up in a place where you are unfamiliar. And, and uh, so if you don't have a good map and compass and know how to use them or, uh, or a GPS that you know how to use, it's pretty easy to get uh, disoriented and uh, get off the track you want to be on. Sun protection, uh, the uh, Colorado sun in the summertime, well, winter or summer, is, is brutal, uh, particularly at the high elevations, especially above tree line when there's snow. Uh, the reflection off of the snow is uh, very intense, and so uh, sun protection uh, for your, both your skin and your eyes is, uh, is critical. Should always carry some extra insulation layers. Uh, kind of the basis for these 10 essentials is to uh, prepare you so that uh, in some kind of an emergency situation, you can safely spend the night in the mountains uh, without uh, risking your life. And uh, so uh, some extra layers of insulation. Uh, I have a uh, ultralight uh, down puffy jacket that's in my pack almost every time I go out. Uh, especially in the wintertime. Some kind of illumination with uh, you know, a headlamp or flashlight and backup batteries, uh, some extra nutrition in you know, whatever kind of uh, uh, energy bars or uh, snacks that uh, work for you. Some extra hydration uh, can be water, can be you know, Gatorade, electrolytes, but uh, staying hydrated in the mountains is extremely important because our humidity here tends to be incredibly low and so uh, uh, even if you're not perspiring you still lose a lot of, uh, of, of water from your system and uh, it's very easy to go through two or three liters of water uh, on a day hike uh, here in the summertime. Some kind of a, uh, a minimal first aid kit. Uh, simple things, uh, most common injuries are blisters, being able to treat some blisters uh, and Certainly cuts and lacerations from, from somebody stumbling on rocks and so forth are very common. Probably the other most common uh, injury is, is a sprained ankle from all the rough uh, terrain. But having a little bit of uh, knowledge as to how to use that, uh, our club puts on a WFA, which is Wilderness First Aid uh, class a couple of times a year to uh, teach people how to uh, handle injuries in the mountains. Uh, some simple, uh, you know, repair kit tools, uh, you know, like a, like a multi-tool, uh, maybe some uh, duct tape, uh, some wire ties perhaps to fix snowshoes or, or uh, skis or something. But it's a simple uh, uh, repair kit. Being able to uh, start and uh, make a fire uh, in emergency conditions. We, we, we normally don't uh, encourage our members to uh, have campfires or, or to start fires, but uh, in an emergency situation, it can uh, certainly be uh, life-saving. And then finally, some kind of emergency shelter. Uh, that looks like a lot of stuff, but uh, the 10 essentials that I carry are, are less than a pound and uh, just a relatively small little package that I drop into the bottom of my pack 
uh, every time I go out. I mentioned the uh, wilderness first aid uh, class. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, even if your cell phone works and if you have the ability to summons help in the case of, of a medical emergency, uh, it's probably going to take the responders at least as long or longer to get to you than it took you to get where you're at. So if you're hiking up Pikes Peak and you know, you're, you're four hours you know, up, up a trail, uh, the El Paso County search and rescue people have to assemble, they have to get their gear together, and then they have to make that same hike. And so uh, it's a slow process to, uh, to summon uh, help in the case of an emergency. I mentioned the wilderness first aid class. And these are kind of just some of the basic things that I carry in my first aid kit. My first aid kit probably weighs five or six ounces, I would guess. Uh, it's not real extensive, but uh, just a few things to be able to treat some of the uh, most common kinds of injuries that, uh, that would occur. I want to talk a little bit about uh, gear and uh, the kinds of gear that uh, are useful here in our Colorado mountains. And I'll talk a little bit about clothing, some about footwear, uh, water treatment, uh, backpacks, and uh, a little bit about trekking poles as well. Let's start with uh, clothing. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, uh, think in terms of, of layers and, and thin layers that you can take on and put off as the conditions change throughout the day and as uh, you, uh, you heat up when you're, when you're making a climb, you may cool off as, as you start to descend. Uh, and so a, a, a real big, heavy, bulky jacket is, is probably not very useful. Uh, but uh, having several thin layers of, uh, of clothing that you can put on and off uh, is, uh, is very useful. And usually start with some kind of a base layer, uh, particularly in the wintertime. I, I like uh, uh, wool, merino wool. Uh, it's uh, extremely uh, warm and uh, it helps you manage uh, moisture from, from perspiration. Uh, and then some kind of a, uh, a mid-layer insulation. Uh, not so much needed in the, in the summertime, but in the uh, uh, in the wintertime, I usually wear uh, some kind of a, of a thin synthetic uh, uh, insulated uh, vest that uh, I find to be very uh, useful. And then finally, some kind of a shell that is uh, waterproof. Something like uh, Gore-Tex is probably the best, but that's also kind of expensive. Uh, there's lots of uh, alternatives for uh, a, a shell that is both wind resistant and water resistant. And uh, so that can be uh, used for multiple purposes, uh, uh, for, for your rain gear, as, as well as uh, uh, a layer of, of insulation and a layer of uh, uh, wind protection. Regulating your body temperature is, uh, is extremely critical because you, you want to avoid perspiration. Uh, as you get wet and your clothing soaks through, uh, it uh, is very easy to get uh, hypothermic and, and cold if, if you stop. And uh, so if you take a lunch break and, and you know, you're, you're soaked through from, from making a climb, uh, it uh, can be very uncomfortable. Uh, one thing I would encourage is to avoid wearing uh, cotton clothing in the mountains. Cotton is absolutely wonderful when it's dry uh, and it's absolutely horrible when it's wet. Uh, cotton loses almost all of its uh, insulation uh, characteristics when it gets wet. And so, you know, you have a, a late afternoon thunder shower come through and, and you get soaked through or you perspire and get soaked through. Uh, wet cotton is almost like wearing nothing. Uh, so almost everything I wear is, is synthetic. Uh, nylons, polyesters, uh, along with wools. And uh, that tends to work much better here in the mountains. The uh, cotton is an incredibly good fabric in the desert but not so good in our mountains. Next. Footwear is uh, critically important. Uh, you know, if you're hiking or backpacking, you're, you're going to be spending a lot of time on your feet. And if you don't have uh, some kind of footwear that's, that's comfortable, it will uh, very quickly be a problem, and you'll end up with blisters, and, and then your, uh, 
not going to have a good day. Fit is just incredibly important. Uh, you know, your, your feet tend to swell during the day and as you walk more. And so uh, getting a pair of shoes that, uh, that fit well after you've been walking for a while is uh, critically important. I like a shoe that has a uh, pretty stiff, rugged sole. Uh, I've tried uh, you know, hiking in lighter weight shoes and they tend to have a, a softer sole. Like try to, try to hike in a, in a pair of running shoes sometime. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll feel absolutely every pebble that you step on. And uh, with, a, uh, with a little heavier duty uh, hiking boot, that stiff sole uh, will allow you to uh, travel over uh, rough rocks and terrain uh, much more comfortably. There's uh, lots of different materials available. Uh, in the wintertime, I, t I tend to wear more uh, leather uh, boots. In the summertime, I, I tend to wear more synthetic. They're a little cooler. Uh, both can be waterproof uh, if you uh, buy the right boot and, uh, and treat them properly. Uh, they also sell a lot of different kinds of uh, inserts for the soles. The inserts that come in a lot of the boots are maybe kind of marginal. Uh, there are some on the market that are uh, much more comfortable and give you a lot more cushion than what you'll get out of the original ones, especially if you've, if you've walked on the original ones for a while. They, they tend to get kind of beat down, and you can, you can replace them with a, uh, uh, a new insert, and it feels like you got a new pair of shoes on almost. Uh, it's good. Some shoes, uh, you know, you, you take them right out of the box and put them on, and they feel fantastic. Uh, and, and some boots, you got to wear them for a long time before they feel that way, it seems like. And so, uh, you know, knowing uh, what kind of boots you've got and uh, uh, how comfortable they are for you is, is critically important. Uh, you don't want to take a brand new pair of boots out of the box and head off on a week-long uh, backpacking trip. And uh, you'll find out uh, about two miles down the road that uh, they're not very comfortable. And so... Uh, uh, you know, know what your situation is and, uh, and give them a little break in time walking around town before you uh, head into the mountains. Uh, for socks, I normally wear wool, uh, even in the summertime. I, I like the, the merino wool a lot. Uh, but uh, something that uh, can kind of wick the uh, moisture, the perspiration away from your, uh, from your skin is good. In the wintertime, uh, gaiters are kind of essential for, uh, for snow conditions. Almost all of my winter outings, I'll wear uh, you know, a, a gaiter that uh, comes up to my knees over top of my boots and the lower part of my pants to uh, keep the snow out of, out of my boots. And uh, it also adds a layer of uh, insulation to the, to the leg. And so uh, it keeps your, uh, your lower leg dry as you're hiking through uh, potentially wet snow and uh, keeps the snow out of your boots so your socks stay dry. And so it's an essential piece of gear. The other one that is essential in the wintertime is uh, some kind of traction devices, particularly on the trails here uh, close to town. They get a lot of use. And so the snow gets packed down, and you know about two days after a snow, the, the trail is solid ice because all that snow has been packed down by hikers. And so if you don't have some kind of traction device on your, on your boots, uh, it will be uh, very difficult to, uh, uh, to traverse the uh, trails safely. There's, there's a variety of different uh, uh, models out there. Uh, the ones that uh, are a little bit more aggressive but uh, are also a lot sturdier uh, tend to be the best. The, uh, uh, some of them have kind of a uh, spiral wire across the sole with a piece of rubber that holds that wire in place. Uh, those are not very useful. Uh, the first time you step on a rock, it cuts that piece of rubber, and, and then they're, they're kind of useless. The, the better ones uh, have the rubber band kind of that goes around your boot, but everything on the bottom surface is uh, steel. Uh, small lengths of chain or, uh, or points to stick into the ice. Uh, but very important for, uh, for uh, winter travel. Actually, the, the only significant injury I've ever uh, 
been associated with uh, uh, was one of my fellow hikers uh, slipped on just a tiny little patch of ice. Uh, the trail was almost all clear. Uh, slipped on a small patch of ice and uh, uh, ended up, uh, you know, hitting her head and, and she had a concussion and uh, and that was, you know, pretty pretty late in the in the spring and you know the snow and most of the ice was gone, uh, but uh, can be uh, fairly significant. Well, let me talk just a little bit about uh, water treatment. This is not so important for uh, day hikes, but. Uh, being able to treat water is uh, extremely important for multi-day trips, but it can also uh, allow you to reduce the weight that you have to carry on a day hike. If you know you're gonna be hiking by sources of water, a stream or a lake, uh, you can easily carry uh, uh, water treatment with you and uh, you know, effectively purify the water that uh, is in the stream or the lake and uh, turn it into good drinking water. Uh, there's uh, really three uh, contaminants uh, in, a, in our mountain streams that are of particular concern is uh, uh, protozoas, the little uh, microbes, uh, that uh, little single cell microbes that live in, in the water, uh, bacteria and viruses. Here in the US, there's virtually no viruses in the water and so it's uh, bacteria and the little uh, protozoas. And in Colorado, the protozoa of particular concern is <clears throat> the uh, cryptosporum. Uh, and if you get that in your system, it, it's pretty nasty. It's very hard to, uh, to get rid of uh, and can kind of keep you sick for a long time. Uh, so there's a variety of ways to treat water. Uh, you should always uh, choose the, the cleanest looking uh, water source that you have and you know particularly right now with the snow melt in the mountains the streams are extremely clean and and look very very nice uh, but they still have uh, contaminants in them. Uh, I did not mention chemical contaminants uh, that is also a possibility it, it's not real likely uh, in the mountains unless you're near some kind of a mining operation perhaps uh, something that's gone on in the past but uh, uh, that, that, that's really not much of a concern most places in the mountains. Uh, these particular methods of cleaning the water will do nothing for chemical contaminants. They'll take care of the, the protozoa, the bacteria, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, viruses. One, if you've got a stove with you, you can always bring the water to a rolling boil. You don't have to boil it for five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Just get it to a rolling boil and uh, it's uh, safe to drink. There's a variety of uh, chemical treatments you can use for uh, uh, treating water. Uh, chlorine dioxide tablets are a common treatment method. It, uh, you can put one tablet in a liter bottle of water to purify it, but the problem with that is uh, it needs to sit for uh, up to four hours before you should drink it, and so you know, usually when you run out of water, you, you kind of need water sooner than four hours. And so I, I always carry some of that with me just as an emergency backup, but I try not to use it. Uh, UV light is uh, extremely good. Uh, I have a little uh, three and a half ounce pen called a Steri pen, uh, and it will purify a liter of water in 90 seconds. It, uh, you just turn it on, stick, it looks like a little fluorescent light bulb tube on the end of the pen. Stick that in the water and stir it for 90 seconds. And it takes care of bacteria, protozoa, and viruses. So, you know, if you're involved in international travel at all, uh, that is a fantastic tool to take with you. It literally weighs about three or four ounces. And uh, uh, the downside is that it, it, it does require batteries. And you know the batteries go dead after a while. I think this one I have will purify 50 liters of water before on one set of batteries, and so a lot of water. And the the light bulb in it will do I don't know hundreds or thousands of liters. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, hand pumps are also available uh, that uh, they will not take out the viruses, but they'll take out the bacteria and the uh, protozoas. Uh, they're typically two stages. Uh, 
but they're also heavier. The one I have, uh, just the, the pump and the filter and everything that goes with it is about a pound. Uh, so it's, it's a little bigger, a little heavier unit. Uh, it, uh, if you've got a big group going out backpacking, uh, you know, carrying something like that among the group is, uh, is, is very practical. Uh, just for a single person out backpacking, it, uh, it's a little heavy. Uh, and one thing to remember also is that uh, snow is, is not pure. <laughs> and uh, uh, melted snow, if you're making uh, water from the melted snow, it needs to be purified just like uh, water coming out of a stream or out of, uh, uh, out of a lake. The, uh, you know, typically, if you're melting snow, you're going to have a stove. And so you'll uh, use the stove to melt the water. But uh, it takes a huge amount of fuel to get it from its melted state to boiling. And so if you use the stove to, uh, to melt the snow, and then once you get it melted, use like a SteriPen or something like that to purify the water, it's, it takes much less fuel than it does to, to try to bring that melted snow all the way up to a rolling boil uh, with your stove. There's a huge variety of uh, backpacks out there. Uh, for day packs, uh, you know, most of them are either internal frame or a lot of them are no frame at all for a small day pack. For a uh, pack that has a frame, they will come in different sizes for different torso lengths. Uh, and you need to get measured if you're going to buy one. I, I'm a fairly tall person, but uh, uh, I, I wear a uh, medium length backpack. Uh, and so you really can't guess uh, what, the, what the right one is. Uh, the shops here in town, Mountain Chalet or uh, REI, are certainly capable of, of measuring your back to uh, figure out what size of pack you should, uh, should wear. And most of them come in a, uh, in a, in a short, medium, and a, and a tall uh, length. For a day pack uh, here in the uh, Colorado Springs area, something in the uh, 20 to 35 liter range will, uh, will cover the needs. I typically use a uh, 20 liter pack in the summertime when I'm carrying a little less stuff, and I'll use about a 35 liter pack in the wintertime when I tend to carry a little bit more gear uh, with me on a day pack. Uh, it needs to be comfortable. Uh, particularly with a comfortable uh, hip belt because you are going to want to carry most of the load of the, of the pack on your hips as opposed to on your shoulders. That's particularly true when you're backpacking and you have a little heavier pack. Uh, you want that load to be on your, on your hips and, and not sitting on your shoulders all day. Uh, the, uh, the shoulder straps uh, really uh, provide stability for the pack, but you're really carrying it on your hips. And you know, the packs these days have a wide variety of uh, pockets and, uh, you know, and internal sleeves for, for camelback type uh, water bladders. Uh, you can get a wide variety of, uh, of features in packs, depending on what you're going to use it for and, uh, and how you're going to use it. Uh, and finally, uh, you can get a uh, pack cover, uh, usually just a a nylon uh, uh, treated material that's waterproof that uh, will fit over your pack if you get caught in a thunderstorm. Uh, for a day pack, that's not terribly important, but uh, if you're out on a week-long backpacking trip and you get caught in a thunderstorm, you, you really don't want everything in your pack to get soaked. And so uh, some kind of a uh, waterproof covering is very helpful. Trekking poles, I use trekking poles all the time. Uh, I've got uh, kind of bad knees, and they help my knees tremendously. Uh, they uh, provide uh, a lot of stability, and particularly on, on rough, rocky terrain, they can uh, help you prevent uh, some ankle injuries, uh, ankle sprains. And like I said, they, they help my knees a lot because I, I take some of the load uh, off with, uh, with the uh, poles. Uh, I find them to be the, uh, the most help actually going downhill. Uh, when, you're, when you're going downhill, there's a lot more force on your, uh, on your leg 
muscles and your leg joints as you're stepping down continually. And using the uh, hiking poles uh, can, can help take some of that load uh, off of your knees and ankles and hips and uh, uh, put a little bit of it into your shoulders and arms and uh, uh, kind of share that, uh, that load with the, uh, with the legs. Weather in uh, Colorado is uh, highly variable. And, uh, you know, we see it here in the, in the spring and summer a lot with the late afternoon uh, uh, thunder showers. And if you're high in the mountains, those afternoon thunderstorms can be extremely dangerous. There's, uh, you know, there's people killed almost every year in Colorado from lightning strikes up in the mountains, typically late in the day. And uh, so if you're, you know, planning to go above tree line in particular, you should start uh, early in the morning. Uh, you know, people always talk about oh, dark 30. <laughs> yeah. but, but getting out on the trail at daylight. And like if you're doing a 14er, uh, you'd, you'd like to be well down off of the mountain by noon. Uh, tons of people are not. Uh, I did uh, Mount Albert uh, last year with, with a couple of friends of mine. And we were on the trail by, I don't know, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we were uh, off of the peak by probably 11, and uh, we were back to tree line easily by, by 12 noon. And you know, it was just like a conga line coming up. And you look west and there's these, all these black clouds coming, you know, and people are still headed for the top, you know, and they're two hours away from getting up there yet. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of people uh, just, I think, don't appreciate how dangerous the weather can be and how quickly it can come in. And so uh, being down off of the peaks early is, uh, is very important. Uh, you know, keep an eye on what the uh, sky is looking like and, uh, and keep an eye on what the weather forecast is for several days, you know, before you go out is, uh, is very important. That uh, www.weather.gov up there is, is a very useful uh, uh, weather forecast tool. It will give you a pinpoint forecast for any place that you want to look at in the continental United States. So if you want to climb Pikes Peak, you can get a pinpoint forecast for the top of Pikes Peak. Uh, and uh, so I find that one to be very helpful. The uh, flash to bang principle uh, just allows you to uh, estimate how far lightning is away. Uh, the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, and so you see the flash of lightning virtually instantaneously when, it, when lightning strikes. But sound only travels about 1,100 feet per second, and so it takes about five seconds for the sound of a lightning strike to travel a mile. And so if you see a strike in the distance, and you can count to 25, that lightning strike is about five miles away from you. Uh, and so it, it gives you a little bit of, uh, uh, of an estimating tool to uh, uh, get some appreciation for how far away the lightning strike might be if you see lightning. Uh, and if it's within that uh, five mile range, it's, uh, it's definitely time to be going down. Uh, hypothermia is a huge uh, issue here in, in Colorado. You know, it can be a uh, beautiful, bright, sunny day, and when that thunderstorm rolls in, the temperature can drop precipitously, and if you're soaking wet, uh, hypothermia is a uh, very serious risk uh, in the mountains. And so uh, wearing the right kind of clothing that I mentioned earlier and having some kind of rain gear uh, can be... Uh, uh, very inexpensive materials, uh, even, even uh, being able to pull a garbage bag on uh, is, is extremely helpful to, uh, to keep dry during those, uh, those thunderstorms. A little bit on uh, hydration, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the humidity here in Colorado is, uh, is extremely low most of the time, and so we lose a lot more uh, moisture out of our bodies than what we might recognize, and so uh, you know, doing some uh, pre-hydrating, drinking a little bit more than usual, maybe drinking some uh, electrolyte kind of drinks the day before can be, your event can be very helpful. And drink uh, 
before you get thirsty. Once you get thirsty, you're already starting into, into dehydration. Uh, dehydration uh, contributes significantly to uh, altitude sickness, and uh, it, uh, it will cause you to have headache, start to feel nauseated, and uh, so staying uh, hydrated is very important. And that, as I mentioned, can be in the range of one and a half to, to three liters a day. Uh, you know, on a, on a long uh, summer day hike, it's not uncommon to go through three liters of water. Uh, and in the wintertime, I, I tend to drink a little less, uh, a liter and a half, you know, maybe, but uh, uh, I probably don't drink as much as I should in the cooler weather because I, I just don't feel as thirsty. Uh, urine output is a, uh, is a crude measure of, uh, of how hydrated you are. Uh, urine should be clear and it should be copious in quantity. Uh, kind of a rough measure, but uh, you know, if, uh, if you're out there all day and you're not urinating, you're not drinking enough. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the last point there, uh, uh, I like uh, electrolyte replacement drinks a lot, particularly in the summertime. Uh, I drink a lot of, uh, of Gatorade and, and those kind of drinks. Uh, I find that they uh, uh, just make me feel better and uh, give me more energy when I'm uh, uh, spending a day in the mountains. Let's see a little bit on nutrition. Uh, over time, you just kind of have to figure out what works for you. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it, how much you need depends a lot on on your personal characteristics. You know, how much you weigh. You know, how much you're carrying for pack weight. So, you know, how much you're climbing during the day affects how many calories you burn uh, and how many hours of activity you're engaged in during the day. But, uh, you know, for a backpacking trip, uh, for uh, most people, you know, a, a pound and a half to two pounds of food per day is sort of normal. Uh, and you just have to kind of figure out what works for you. Uh, when I go out on a day hike, I usually make myself a, a sandwich that I eat at lunchtime, and I take a bunch of high-energy uh, snacks uh, that I'll eat throughout the day, particularly if I'm climbing, uh, like climbing a 14er, doing a lot of elevation gain. Those uh, goo packs, uh, I, I find to be wonderful. Uh, they're, they're about 110 calories per little pack. The, the texture of the stuff is a little bit like honey. Uh, and some people don't like the texture of it, but uh, it's like a straight shot into the bloodstream, I think. <laughs> those, those things work for me. Uh, I like the, uh, the honey stingers are kind of similar, and uh, kind bars are, seem to be very digestible for me. Uh, I've eaten so many cliff bars, I never want to see another cliff bar again. Uh, and I like to take something uh, hot along with me in the wintertime. I go out in the wintertime a lot, snowshoeing and uh, uh, spending time in the backcountry. I, I like it actually more than I do the summer because there's nobody out there. And especially if you're out during the week, uh, weekends, you know, there'll be people out snowshoeing. But, but during the week, there's nobody out there. And so the winter outings are really, really pleasant. And uh, being able to uh, stop and... Uh, have some hot chocolate or some hot tea is, is really invigorating at, uh, at lunchtime if you're a little bit chilly. A couple of points here on, uh, on trip planning. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, you know, research the route that you're going to uh, uh, hike or backpack uh, ahead of time, and there's a huge number of resources available. Uh, here in uh, this area, uh, one of the uh, maps that is very useful is the Pikes Peak Atlas. Uh, I think it's about eight bucks, uh, but it has very uh, detailed topographic maps of the entire Pikes Peak Massif and uh, a very, very useful trip planning tool. There's also a huge amount of information online. If you're gonna do uh, 14ers, uh, the website 14ers.com, 14ers.com uh, has a wealth of information and trip reports uh, on, from people that have recently climbed particular mountains. 
There's, there's books available, uh, just a, a lot of online resources uh, that you can tap into. Uh, I have uh, several pieces of uh, topographic uh, mapping software that I use. One of the better ones that I have found here recently is it's, it's, a, it's a website. It's called Caltopo, C-A-L-T-O-P-O.com. And uh, it's a guy in California that has put all of the topographic maps of the U.S. into this website. It's free. You can, you can go in there and you can get extremely detailed topographic maps for any trail you want to walk in the continental United States. Uh, wonderful tool. Uh, you know, think about, uh, you know, what your uh, hiking speed might be uh, for a group of kind of average hikers. A couple of miles an hour is, is pretty close. Uh, depends on how much you're climbing and how much you're, you're descending. Uh, you know, it might be, uh, you know, another, as much as another hour for a thousand feet of elevation gain, uh, depending on how good a shape people are in, you know. I see some people out there that run up 14ers. Uh, I'm, I'm not one of those, uh, but there are people that do that. I mentioned the uh, weather forecasts earlier. Uh, you know, keep track of the weather forecasts for several days so you kind of know what's, uh, what's coming. Uh, in the wintertime, if you're doing backcountry activities uh, uh, in avalanche terrain, particularly backcountry skiing and uh, Snowshoeing, you usually don't get into that kind of terrain so much, uh, but uh, the backcountry skiers uh, are at huge risk for avalanche. And the uh, Colorado Avalanche Information Center, CAIC uh, website, has uh, uh, detailed forecasts for the avalanches all around Colorado uh, for every day during, basically during the ski season. The people that put that together, most of them work for the ski resorts. And so uh, once the ski resorts shut down, those people are, are no longer doing that. And, and you can certainly have avalanche problems into the spring past the ski season. Uh, but uh, knowing uh, you know, what avalanche terrain is and what, what, the, what the problem areas are is, is essential for those kind of activities. And then finally, uh, you know, doing some uh, emergency planning ahead of time, uh, providing, uh, you know, if you've got a group, uh, so that the, the trip leader kind of knows, uh, you know, what the uh, emergency contact is for everybody in the group if they have some kind of a problem. Uh, you know, who in the group has uh, first aid training? Do you have a nurse? Do you have a doctor in the, in the group, perhaps? Uh, and any uh, personal medical conditions that uh, uh, members of the group have, they should share that confidentially with the, with the trip leader uh, so that the leader knows uh, if you have, you know, a severe, you know, allergy to, to insect bites or, you know, bee stings, you know, if you're, if you're carrying an EpiPen for, uh, uh, for bee stings or something like that. Uh, should uh, also carry an emergency contact card with uh, uh, you know, all of the uh, emergency information of who should be contacted if you have a problem, you know, who your doc is and those kind of things. Uh, I also have a uh, personal locator beacon that I carry with me most of the time. Uh, mine is made by Spot, it's called, and uh, uh, it uh, communicates with the satellites and so it can send an emergency message that will eventually come back to the, if I'm in El Paso County, it'll come back to the El Paso County search and rescue team. And uh, uh, one of my friends uh, utilized that out at the uh, Lost Creek Wilderness uh, last uh, year in June, and uh, it worked fantastic. They pushed the button on this little transmitter and uh, it activated the uh, search and rescue team, and the search and rescue team came and, and got a person out that was having some medical difficulties. Uh, so you might consider that it's a little bit expensive. Uh, the, uh, the unit costs about 100 bucks, and uh, uh, there is a, uh, uh, an annual fee on it that's also about 100 bucks a year for the use of it. Uh, 
But if you spend a lot of time in the backcountry, particularly if you're going by yourself, uh, it's a wonderful tool. Cell phones are also wonderful, but some places in the mountains, you know, there's, there's no service. Uh, and if you're climbing uh, mountains, you might think about uh, what your emergency exit routes are. How can you quickly get down below tree line if you need to, if a thunderstorm rolls in? Uh, and, uh, you know, what county are you going to be in? And who is, uh, who is the sheriff for this county? Uh, you know, if I have an emergency, it's going to end up flowing through the sheriff's office into the search and rescue uh, group. And those details should be left with... Uh, some responsible person that, at home. Uh, that, uh, so somebody knows where you're going and uh, what time to expect you back and what time to be concerned if you're not back. Uh, and so that they know where you're going and who to contact, uh, who the sheriff is in that particular area. Uh, Leave No Trace uh, is uh, a uh, group of principles that allow us to uh, you know, leave the mountain environment kind of as we found it, uh, so that the next person that comes to enjoy it can uh, enjoy it as much as, as we did. And so it involves uh, you know, planning ahead, knowing what you're going to do, knowing how you're going to do it, uh, camping and, uh, and hiking on durable surfaces. Uh, Sometimes that's not possible, but you want to have as little impact on the vegetation as you can possibly have. Uh, you want to dispose of waste properly, and in most cases, for, you know, for, for certainly for trash and stuff like that, that means carrying it out with you. Uh, and uh, disposing of human waste properly uh, away from sources of water uh, is part of that principle. Uh, leaving what you find if you find something really neat out there that uh, uh, is of historic significance, uh, it's actually not legal to take it uh, if it's more than 50 years old in the national forests. And, uh, but uh, if you find something neat, uh, you should leave it so that the next person that, can, that finds it can, can enjoy it. Uh, and we generally encourage people not to have campfires. Uh, you know, we have so much fire danger uh, here in Colorado with the uh, low humidity and it's so dry. Uh, but uh, if you're going to have a campfire, uh, you know, try to use an established site with a, a properly constructed uh, campfire ring. But uh, best not to have one. Uh, respect the wildlife and, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, treading on their territory and so... Uh, we want to uh, minimize our impact on them and be considerate of, of others. There's, there's a lot of people out there using the mountains. Uh, you know, if you've climbed any 14ers here lately, there are just tons of people climbing the 14ers. And, uh, uh, you know, be considerate of, of those people that are out there with you. Just a couple of quick slides here on uh, animals uh, that we have here in Colorado. Uh, we have black bear. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, to Heidi earlier, I have hiked hundreds of days in the mountains in Colorado and have slept out many, many nights. And I have never, ever seen a black bear anywhere in Colorado. Uh, you know, some of my friends from Woodland Park have invited me to, uh, to come by their house and uh, uh, take a look at their trash cans at night if I want to see a black bear. Uh, but uh, uh, Honestly, hiking, I've, I've never seen a black bear in Colorado. Uh, I saw one one time in Oregon, or I mean in Washington, and one in California. And as soon as they figured out that we were around, I mean, they were gone. They wanted nothing to do with us. And so it's very unlikely to, to see a, a black bear. Uh, but uh, kind of the, the key point is there, you, you don't want to run. Uh, and... Uh, if it, uh, if it does attack, you fight back, uh, but uh, that's very, very unlikely. Uh, you know, if you happen to uh, wander between a, uh, a mother and her cubs, uh, she, might, uh, she might attack, but uh, uh, not likely. Kind of the same story with mountain lions. Our mountains are full of lions. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I get out a lot in the wintertime, and up around uh, Palmer Lake, uh, above Palmer Lake, uh, 
you know, you go out there after a fresh snow and you're likely to see a lot of mountain lion tracks. I have been out there, I think it was December last year, and I think we saw hundreds of mountain lion tracks on that particular hike. And it was, there was, you know, a couple inches of fresh snow. So they're out there, uh, but again, I've never seen one. Uh, you know, they always say that uh, the mountain lions are, they probably see you, uh, but uh, they really don't want anything to do with you, and uh, very unlikely that you'll ever see one. Again, don't run. Uh, that uh, triggers, a, you know, a, an attack uh, mode from, from the lions, but uh, if you were attacked, again, fight back. Uh, marmots are... Uh, uh, a bit of a problem for backpackers, not so much for day, day hikers, but uh, they like to eat your gear. And, uh, you know, they like the salt from perspiration that might be in the, the handles of your hiking poles or in the straps of your uh, backpack. And uh, if you leave those things on the ground <clears throat> at night, uh, they'll eat the handles off of your poles <laughs> and they'll eat the straps off of your backpacks. Uh, <clears throat> So don't leave those things out overnight uh, on the ground. Next one there, Heidi. Uh, the most dangerous animal in North America is a moose. Uh, you, know, you, you hear a lot about mountain lions, black bears, grizzly bears. There are a lot more people injured and killed from moose than there are any other animals. Uh, and Colorado is starting to get a lot more moose population than they've had in the past. Uh, you know, they've even been here in town uh, recently. I've seen uh, several moose up around uh, the Lake City area. I uh, came across one in uh, the Lost Creek Wilderness uh, this last year. So they are around. Uh, try to keep your distance from them. Uh, you know, I just saw on uh, Facebook this morning while I was eating breakfast, uh, uh, a woman tried to pet a buffalo up in Custer National Park up in South Dakota, or Custer State Park. And uh, you know, she got gored. Uh, these are wild animals. Uh, they look kind of big and docile sometimes, but, but they are unbelievably strong and they are wild animals. And uh, so uh, keep your distance from them. Most of the attacks uh, uh, with moose tend to involve dogs. Uh, that's also true, I've heard, relative to bears and uh, mountain lions. Uh, you know, the smaller animals will... Uh, uh, go uh, barking after, after the, the big animal, and the big animal follows them back to you uh, and uh, can cause a problem for you. Uh, this next one here I got from Dean. A, a mad moose is, uh, has its uh, head lowered, its ears pinned back, raised hackles, licking its snout, or maybe none of these. <laughs> Just don't mess with the moose. <laughs> uh, moose can, uh, can kick uh, in 360 degrees from, from their bodies, and they have very sharp hooves, and if you ever fall down and they're mad at you, uh, they will stomp on you, and uh, that's where most people get uh, most seriously injured. And so uh, whatever you do, try to, try to get something large in between you and the moose, whether it's trees or a car or whatever, rocks, and uh, uh, try to stay on your feet so that... Uh, the moose can't get you down. So kind of my conclusion is that uh, the wilderness environment around us is uh, not our natural environment and it can be uh, extremely unforgiving uh, if we're not properly prepared. It is a fantastic place we live in and being able to enjoy the outdoors here is uh, such a, uh, uh, a wonderful aspect of, of living here. You know, within just a few minutes of our house, we can be kind of out in the middle of nowhere. But uh, that uh, does have uh, hazards associated with it if, if we're not uh, properly prepared. So kind of, you know, plan to take your uh, little uh, survival bubble with you. And uh, you may be going out for a two-hour uh, day hike. But, you know, you could have some kind of a problem and you could end up spending the night. Uh, are you prepared to do that or not? Uh, I mentioned with the weather, uh, turn around, the mountains are always going to be there. Uh, you know, 
you can climb Pikes Peak uh, this week or you can climb Pikes Peak next week or next year. Uh, it's going to be there. And uh, uh, if conditions are not safe, uh, it's best to turn around. And as I mentioned, the, uh, you know, the three dimensions that we uh, kind of talk a lot about in the Mountain Club uh, with uh, having a safe experience is being properly prepared and uh, having some knowledge of, of what we're doing and uh, developing experience. Particularly, that's useful in going out with other people that have that experience so you can learn from them and develop your own personal experience so that uh, you get uh, that good judgment built up so you can make proper decisions uh, when you're in the mountains. That's as much as I have prepared for today. I'd be uh, happy to uh, answer questions if you have any.